You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 13, 2013, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, measurement of specific IgE antibodies. Our presenter is Dr. Brock Williams. He's an adjunct professor in the section of allergy, asthma, and immunology at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Um, um, good morning, everybody. We're going to start the second hour of COLA today. Um, we have the pleasure of having um, Brock Williams here, Dr. Brock Williams here, um, to talk about measurement of specific IgE um, antibodies. And Brock has been doing work in this area for years, and we're pleased to have him here to give us his expertise. Go ahead, Brock. Oh, thanks, Paul. Uh, I, I probably should have come down there, but I'm just too lazy to make that drive all the time. <laughs> I, 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 okay. Okay. Uh, first, the disclosures. I have nothing to disclose, uh, only that I really uh, like objective data to make uh, conclusions, and I think we, we seem to have a lack of that in this field. Um, this is somebody's definition of allergy. And I put it up for a couple reasons, and that uh, it's it's been defined in a lot of different ways, but it's it's really a conundrum of uh, of symptoms with multiple causes. And um, here it says it's a, a, a reaction to a normally harmless substance. Well, I I think I take very strong issue with that statement, and that most of these most of the allergens now that we know about are actually uh, act somewhat like toxins to, to our systems, and I'll explain that a little bit uh, further down the line. Um, it's also uh, been defined as, uh, you know, skin problems, warmth, swelling. I don't think pain is, is in there. But I think the problem is, is that the field is kind of full of dogma and uh, strengthened by uh, people keep repeating that dogma. And uh, I don't think, uh, so I'll illustrate that, I think, in, in this lecture on, uh, on IgE. Let's see, I got to do this each time. I mean, these don't look like harmless substances. OK. Uh, what, what I want to do today is, is essentially kind of go over some of the history and the problems uh, that have been encountered and, uh, with respect to interpretation. And, and what's been going on in this field over the last uh, 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 time to, to form some of our opinions. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit about amino assays and the assay uh, performance characteristics, but I'd like to spend a little time on innate and adaptive IG biology uh, because essentially uh, we're finding some very strong ties with Th2 uh, immunoadaptive responses with the innate immune system. Uh, I'll try to get some stuff in on allergens and uh, what we know about them and uh, if I have time and then uh, talk about some clinical correlates and controversies and some new stuff. Um, the reason we run tests, I think it's, it's important to kind of go back and look at this because um, we're looking for information relevant to the discrimination of diseases, but a test doesn't really diagnose. Uh, tests essentially change the pretest odds, uh, and they're really a measurement of risk. Uh, and you shouldn't run a test if you don't think it can it can tell you something about the risk. Uh, there are a lot of variables in 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 tests and the interpretation, and uh, for this reason. Uh, the results always have to be interpreted in the context of each patient. And, of course, we all know that sensitization doesn't always mean sensitivity, and uh, sometimes we forget that. Some of the history is pretty interesting. Uh, we're all aware of Charles Blackley and, uh, well, this is 1873, uh, when he, uh, in the winter, he uh, took grass pollen and scratched himself with it. And, got a wheel and the erythema response and proved that it was uh, the, the symptoms of hay fever were probably due to uh, the pollen. Uh, this Ramirez guy published a paper in Lancet in 1919 after he did a blood transfusion in a patient. The patient went outside. People were pretty hardy in those days. And uh, the patient went outside and got in his horse carriage and broke out with uh, urticaria. And so it, uh, 
when they looked back at it, it turned out that the blood came from a patient that was allergic to horses. Uh, Otto Prosnitz, this doctor, uh, his patient, Kuster, and we're all familiar with the PK test, which we can't do anymore for obvious reasons, but uh, Kusner was allergic to fish, and Prosnitz put uh, Kusner's sera in his uh, stomach uh, skin and then uh, ate fish and had a reaction. So we knew there was something in the sera that was, uh, that was causing this, and everyone referred to this as reagen. Uh, this Art de Besch is a Norwegian who did hundreds of PK tests, and it's, his name is never even mentioned in the literature, which is, uh, is too bad because this guy really established that uh, the cosmology was in from uh, something in the serum. Uh, there were publications uh, in the early 60s about uh, it must be IgA because it, it came in column chromatography. It, it, it was a uh, uh, heavier than most immunoglobulins, uh, with the exception of M, and, and it, it, it's probably IgA. But then they discovered that a lot of IgA deficient patients still had allergies. Lou Perlmutter uh, uh, actually published a paper in 64 that said that the reagent factor is not A, G, M, or D. Uh, and then uh, the issue Zakas in Denver uh, did some rather elaborate uh, immunochemistry using his own sera. He was very allergic to ragweed. And I, I was actually in the room when he brought the slides in. And it was uh, an immunodiffusion. And uh, the problem was is there was no, there was no uh, band there. David Talmadge, and I didn't really understand this that well. I was a fledgling graduate student. And, uh, David Talmadge says, well, maybe the precipitate is there. Why don't you incubate that with radio-labeled uh, uh, antigen E? And he did and came back a month later and says, yeah, the band is there. Uh, we've identified uh, 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 the factor that's responsible for allergies. It was actually called IgE because it caused uh, erythema. Uh, Bennett and John Hansen discovered a, a farmer and Sweden that had an atypical myeloma protein. They uh, got together on this and the WHO consolidated and, and, uh, 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 and uh, determined that IG represented a new class of immunoglobulin. In 74, uh, the RAS tests and the PRIS tests were introduced. And we were really excited about this because uh, at the time uh, uh, there wasn't too many things we could measure that uh, and all of a sudden we had something that we could measure that was objective and, uh, and it was a, a kind of an exciting time in allergy. Uh, the assay is based on uh, 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 a person in yellow discovery of a competitive radioimmune assay. And this is kind of interesting because uh, Rosalind was a, uh, uh, a woman and in those days, women uh, were deemed not smart enough to go to graduate school. And uh, I won't say anything else about that, but it was kind of interesting. She kind of backdoored it, and, and she was the second woman to win the Nobel Prize which uh, uh, for, for her work. At any rate, it's, uh, I won't show a diagram, but solid phase immunoassays are fairly simple. Uh, the allergen or the extract the proteins are attached to a solid phase, solid phase incubated serum, uh, it's washed, uh, then you put a detection antibody in there, excess of that is washed away, and you measure uh, how much stuck, and these measurements are compared to a calibration curve. Um, it was, uh, once people got onto this, all of a sudden there were all sorts of companies coming into this field with new tests, they all had different allergen sources, chemistries, solid phases, and different detection antibodies and scoring. And in the 80s, uh, they were actually, all allergists were uh, being pursued to put in machines in their offices for, uh, to do in vitro testing. And uh, there were some problems here. There were all these different uh, varieties were hard to uh, distinguished because they're all referred to as RAS tests. Uh, they're all reported out in similar logarithmically uh, or semi-logarithmically related classes. 
and, and the tests were obviously not equivalent to each other. And all the extracts were named the same thing, even though they were different sources and probably quite variable. And even today, we see marketing studies that are published with selective data and questionable statistics to uh, uh, bolster uh, one test or the other. So you have to be uh, alert to this. Um, there was a, uh, all these different uh, results uh, from different studies. Uh, and also, there are problems with clinical standards, which we might discuss a little bit about. But um, Everything came down, and the allergists essentially uh, decided to boycott the area. And it wasn't just for, wasn't just because the science uh, didn't agree with the, the study showed all this variability. It was uh, some economic considerations and political considerations there. And uh, it was actually quite unfortunate because uh, the allergists could have played a much bigger role in trying to make these tests better. And I, I like to show this picture that the allergists really didn't like in vitro. And some of that still uh, hangs around, which uh, I think is also unfortunate. At any rate, um, the field kind of got its act together. Uh, FDA uh, instigated uh, approval of, uh, for, for manufactured devices. Um, they set the, these standards fairly high in that you need at least 100 positive samples, as recommended by the FDA, to, to have a positive test and about 30 negatives, which is, you know, that's pretty strict. And considering the number of allergen extracts, that's uh, a lot of work. CLIA 88 uh, instigated uh, personal, uh, personnel qualifications and, and all the things that laboratories have to do in record keeping and inspection safety. And CAP surveys. Uh, uh, in proficiency testing, um, labs uh, adhere to this. Uh, the problem is, it's you can't do a whole lot of allergens, and it's usually it's been reported in classes. It's now reported in quantitative uh, measurements so you can compare things. But there's not enough systems to actually do the statistics on to do this uh, uh, the quantitative reporting. Uh, and the CSI, which used to be NACLS, uh, published. Uh, a new uh, manual in 2008, uh, which essentially harmonizes the manufacturers and laboratory and users' uh, opinions and methods, and uh, it's it's a, a very good document to uh, establish uh, quality control in this field. At any rate, uh, in 1992, the, the immunocap was introduced, and it it actually replaced the fate of this RAS test, which was the market leader. It's just kind of surprising for a company to uh, replace uh, what it's already selling. Uh, it had a highly increased binding capacity. They cleaned up the allergens a bit, and uh, washing steps were improved. And, and even today, it's the only assay that shows that one kilounit of allergen-specific Ig is equal to 2.42 nanograms. It's the only assay that is actually quantitative. Um, and, of course, it's automated and it's uh, fairly precise. And I, one, of the, one of the reasons it works so well is because of this large uh, binding capacity of the sponges. And uh, the reason this is important is, is a, a little stuff on immunochemistry. We know that a nanogram of Ig is about 3 million molecules. Uh, and therefore, when when you when you're actually running one single test from the sera, um, this is the low end of the curve. So you're measuring quite a few other molecules in that. And so the laws of mass action kind of apply. And something people don't really realize, and I think you've heard me ask questions about this in in several lectures, is that um, there's a relationship between concentration and affinity. And if you have a, a uh, KA association, let's see, an association of, say, oh, 10 to the 6, uh, actually antibodies are between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 8, and you have uh, uh, a, a molar concentration of three sites to bind, let's say, of uh, 10 to the 5th, then you will, no matter what the concentration is, you can bind 91% of it. 
The problem is, is when these numbers change and you have fewer, uh, lesser binding sites, that no matter what you do in an assay that, that has uh, 10 to the 6 uh, and 10 to the minus 6 uh, uh, binding sites, you're only going to bind 50%, no matter what you do. So it's concentration independent and affinity dependent. Now the take home lesson from this is that if you, unless you have a large capacity of binding, uh, your assay is going to be affinity dependent. And where this comes into play now is several places, and it's formed some rather poor opinions. For example, in allergen extract standardization, they use microtiter uh, plates, which have a very low uh, uh, binding of allergen. And that, that can certainly, uh, uh, it, it certainly probably be in an assay with a range of around uh, 50 to 9 percent bound. So in other words, if you're trying to see if uh, measure how much allergen you have, it's probably not a very accurate measurement. And secondly, uh, when we look at experiments to look at the stability of allergen extracts, uh, the same problem exists and that you would never see degradation of a, a particular allergen that you're measuring with an affinity dependent assay. And that is in fact what is used. So you have to interpret those results with a lot of caution. At any rate, uh, no one really had a standard, but we know that an ideal quantitative immunoassay has a slope on a semi-log curve of 1. And it should, uh, for example, if you uh, dilute your sample in half, uh, you should get half as much and down, the, uh, down the line. So we did this with uh, samples we sent out. Um, this was in 2000. Uh, we sent out about uh, 12,000 individual samples to five different laboratories, blinded, uh, and sent them through physicians' offices so the laboratories didn't know what was, what was up. And we found that these methods, method A, B, and C, differed uh, quite, uh, quite a lot with respect to their ability to, uh, with respect to their variability. We see method C, uh, average R squared is a measure of overall variability over a range. And, and a, a lot of these were uh, uh, actually had a lot of variability, and one of them didn't. And even on top of that, we sent out dilutions of the same samples, and uh, they ran the tests. And several, not all, but several of, of the allergen uh, responses uh, showed a non-significant curve. In other words, they showed the same answer regardless of whether it was diluted or not, and they were probably affinity-dependent assays. Uh, so, so obviously, uh, the criticisms in vitro have certainly been justified. Um, I just wanted to show a quick slide of why precision is important as we develop uh, relationships between the sum of Ig uh, antibody concentration and the probability of uh, people reacting to exposure to that particular allergen or allergen extract. And uh, the only way you can do some quantitation is to have a low CV. And uh, if you have a larger CV, you know, like this is 25 percent, you can see that you can't tell where you really are on this curve. And this is a real problem, particularly for skin testing, as I think the target is like 30% CVs, even with histamine. And so we have to, for this reason, conclude that uh, the skin testing is essentially not quantitative. Um, again, we looked at precision and we found one particular assay that, that showed a, a pretty good precision over the range. And, Remember, these are blinded samples, so uh, and 12,000 samples of different specificities. So, uh, uh, actually, we get better results nowadays. That the actually CVs are around five percent of the real cap. Um, I mentioned this uh, relationship between Ig concentration and probability, but uh, we'll have a different slant on it in a few minutes. But Obviously, uh, there is a relationship, and it might differ for different allergen, allergen uh, solid phases. And so uh, here we see a big difference between the curves in house dust mite and cat dander. 
and dog dander. And it turns out dog dander is a very poor extract, uh, both for skin testing and for in vitro, unless it's supplemented with, uh, with several of the proteins that are relevant in the in vitro test. Um, we have looked in the past at uh, using chimeric antibodies, and this seems to be the best way to standardize these tests. And chimeric antibodies are antibodies that have uh, uh, the FAB portion uh, from a mouse and the rest is humanized, and so it really looks like IgE. So you can artificially make an IgE to react, uh, to, to bind to the allergen of interest. And when we did that, uh, and then sent samples, again blinded to the laboratories, and asked them to measure total IgE, which this, uh, this is the actual amount of IgE in it, we get a very good concordance. And total IgE assays are, uh, uh, there's several different ones, but they're pretty much in control. And they, they, uh, they give uh, fairly accurate results. But then if you take uh, three different assays, which are actually on the market today, <coughs> and look at them, uh, and measure allergen-specific IgE, you can see that one of them gives the amount that should be there and on dilutions. One of them shows no uh, very small results and no relationship to dilution. And another one shows uh, exaggerated levels of, uh, uh, of measurement. So that exists in the market today, and that's why I showed that previous slide that uh, you and I look alike, but uh, there the resemblance ends. So you have to be careful which assays you're, you're running. Yeah, one nice thing about in vitro uh, tests, the blood tests, is that you can actually demonstrate analytical specificity. This is something you can't do with skin testing. For example, how can you inhibit a skin test with a substance that causes it? Uh, you can't. Uh, in in vitro, you can perform this little trick where you can immunoblot the uh, uh, patient, uh, the allergen, uh, and th these are uh, positive bands from pa different patients' sera, and then you can pre-incubate it with that solid phase and show that you removed it all. So this this corresponds to this band re uh, corresponds to the removal of this one, and uh, and uh, this one this one and etc. So you can show that you really are uh, measuring something uh, that. That you can you can actually tell what you're measuring, and you're measuring all of it that's that's in those samples. Here's the big problem. The big problem when you run an immunocap. These are again immunoblots of a series of patients that are sensitized to a particular allergen extract, and uh, this is just the molecular weight banding patterns. And these are the, the patterns that different patients show. And this all represents different patients' IgEs to, uh, to proteins in that extract. Well, here's the problem. Let's say this is a relevant protein. Uh, and you can see it in this patient. You can see it in this patient. You can't see it in this patient. And if you looked at the results of your in vitro testing, you'd say, wow, this uh, patient 15 has a lot of specific IgE to that allergen. But in fact, uh, and, and in fact, 14 uh, has, has a much smaller amount to all the rest that's in there, but, is, uh, but it's almost wholly directed against a relevant allergen. So this patient might have a low specific IgE result, but might be highly uh, exquisitely sensitive to that particular allergen. Whereas some of these other patients that have all this IgE uh, may not be as sensitive, but they have a really high measurement. This is uh, this is a really big problem in our interpretation of the results. You can actually also uh, look at this the same way uh, with respect to skin testing, uh, knowing this information, and and uh, get results that are uh, similar to the in vitro, and um, uh, and that makes our interpretation of these tests somewhat difficult. So if we take another look at these curves that are really their logistic curves um, that show the relationship of Ig antibody concentration and probability of reacting, you see these curves are probably a 
a compilation of a whole bunch of different curves to individual allergens. So that's what's represented here. And, and so it, it, uh, it kind of uh, it does say that the higher your IgE concentration, the more apt you are to make Ig or have IgE to a relevant allergen, but it is not completely necessary. Uh, I mean, it doesn't follow for some of the low levels. And, and so you can see that, uh, that these studies are, uh, of uh, antibody thresholds and, and such are not uh, are, are open to uh, uh, some problems. Yeah, there's some complexities uh, that we should consider in, uh, in looking at IgE uh, data, and, and, uh, and uh, these are a few of them. For example, we know that the IgE system targets specific proteins. For example, uh, if you make one IgE, you make an IgE to a particular epitope, then that, that uh, allergen can be presented using that IgE uh, and present to other epitopes of that particular uh, protein. And that, that sort of targets proteins and, and eventually what we end up with is, is enough IgE to that particular target to uh, give us, give us uh, bridging of molecules and thus triggering mast cells and release of mediators. Also, uh, when you get an IgE, uh, uh, when someone is sensitized, they release cytokines, uh, they'll react and release cytokines, which will actually induce more IgE to anything else that's around there. And these, this is referred to as bystander effects. And, and it's probably why we get these different banding, uh, uh, different uh, banding patterns, because once you've made IgE to, to one thing, and then you have uh, IgE-induced inflammation, you get IgE to other things that are, that are accompanying that. We, uh, there, there is evidence now that affinity certainly makes a difference. If you make a high affinity IgE antibody, you're obviously going to need less of it, and you'll recognize and bind the allergen more tightly. There are actually studies showing that this is, this is relevant to uh, how much mediator release you get. Uh, clonality is another uh, interesting area here that, that's not given you, uh, it's not reported on the test results. And essentially, uh, this is when you make, uh, when you target, you might make uh, different clones of IgE, and, uh, and you might make a whole bunch of them. If you make too many, uh, then, then maybe the Ig will interfere with the bridging. Uh, on the same token, you, can, you could actually make a whole bunch of one clone and very little of another, and therefore have a relatively amount of high specific Ig, but little reactivity because you can't get bridging. Uh, there are reports out that the specific activity of Ig is important. That would be the specific IgE that you have directed against a particular allergen over the total IgE. And the way to envision this, it envisage, envisage this is that you essentially have a, a, a pie. And the pie is total IgE, and the specific IgE is the size of the slice of that pie. It makes really good sense, uh, and some people have provided evidence that that this is relevant. Uh, we have tried to do, try to repeat these experiments in a lot of different uh, variations and haven't had a lot of success. Specific activity is probably important for the initial reactivity to, to show reactivity, but I, I'm not sure it's really clinically relevant. And I think uh, um, some other studies will bear me out on that. One thing we do know is that the allergens, uh, you know, there's what, 1,200 extracts that have been approved by the FDA. The allergens uh, in those extracts are highly cross-reactive. And uh, so that multiple banding pattern I showed you a few minutes ago, it could be a result of all this cross-reactivity in that people are sensitized to, uh, 
to uh, certain allergens that, that are common among, uh, uh, they're sensitized to, to an allergen and they react to another extract which has that uh, allergen or uh, epitope in it. So these are all problems in interpreting uh, these, these results. A very important paper I think I recommend to people uh, and I don't really have time to talk about it, but it's it's pretty neat. Jay quotes this paper a lot, I think. And it's uh, entitled Allergen Cross-Reactions, a Problem Greater Than Ever Thought. And uh, it, I, I highly recommend uh, reading this and trying to understand it, and you'll understand what, what we mean by an IgE repertoire. Okay, in immunology, we know uh, in TH2 immunology, we, we know, of course, IL-4, 5, and 13 are really important, particularly in the, uh, in the switch to uh, synthesis of IgE from the other isotypes. But also now we're finding that IL-33 really is a big player. IL-25 and uh, uh, TSLP, uh, <laughs> uh, stromal lipopoietin, but it's, uh, that, it's essentially a, also a, uh, a cytokine. Uh, we also know that the epithelial is important. The epithelial actually makes these uh, IL-33 and 25 uh, in, in reaction to, uh, to damage or alarms, which I'll get into in a minute. We know that CD1D is important. Uh, it's, on, uh, it's the MHC type receptor that's on the uh, uh, natural killer uh, helper cells, and uh, it seems to be uh, uh, promote uh, uh, TH2 responses to uh, lipophilic uh, molecules. Uh, and the mast cell and base cells kick out some of these cytokines specifically too when they're activated. But recently there have been a lot of studies showing that uh, TLR4 seems to be a prerequisite for making IgE. If you don't have TLR4, which is, of course, the uh, toll-like receptor for endotoxin and, uh, and some other bacterial products in combination with TL2, but um, if you don't have it, you don't make IgE. Uh, so it's obviously uh, involved in, in, uh, in TH2 immunology. This high uh, mobility uh, group box one protein also if you don't have if you don't uh, make large amounts of that you don't get th2 responses and its binding site is called rage which is uh, uh, is uh, what the heck does that stand for I always mess it up because rage is such a strong word uh, it's a receptor for um, alternative glycation end products and uh, these are nuclear proteins in, in, in most cells, uh, particularly macrophages and epithelial cells, uh, all cells actually, uh, as are some of the uh, cytokines, IL-33 for example, IL-1. And uh, when the cells are activated in a particular way, these things uh, get out of the nucleus and go into the circulation and, and then find receptors and do their thing. And without the RAGE receptor, without the high mobility growth box 1 protein, you don't get IgE, which is pretty interesting because it gives us a target uh, uh, to look at and something to measure that's involved in allergic responses. Alarmins, uh, another area that you should familiar yourself, familiarize yourselves with because alarmins, inflammasome, uh, proteostasis and redox proteins, and even the FC receptor 1, all seem to be involved uh, heavily in TH2 immun immunobiology. The reason this might be important is because you can, uh, it, you can have IgE, but is it causing problems or where did it come from? Did it, did it, were the problems already existent, the inflammation already there? Uh, and as a result, you produce Ig antibodies to enhance that inflammation, or uh, or is it irrelevant? Uh, in some cases, it it may well be irrelevant to the symptoms. Okay. Uh, I said I was going to mention a couple things about some studies. Uh, you know, most of the studies you read are dichotomous studies. 
their yes or no answers and uh, whether a patient is, uh, whether the test is positive or negative depends on its cutoffs and sometimes that's questionable. And all these studies are population studies and you always have to ask the question, how does that relate to an individual patient? Uh, in my opinion, it doesn't. Um, we have, uh, we don't really have a, stud, a standard in any of these studies in interpreting clinical sensitivity and specificity. Mostly, uh, a lot of times you use the history, the physical exam, and that has, uh, in, in a paper that Jay and I published uh, some years ago, has a false positive rate of about 22 uh, percent. It's mainly due to heuristic errors and uh, and you can read the paper to understand that. The skin test is not a very good standard because it also has a lot of problems, uh, not to mention the allergen extracts, but uh, the variability of the skin test itself. Even the double-blind placebo-controlled flu challenge, uh, we don't know what the sensitivity and specificity of it is. And so, uh, we, we, we call it a standard, but, but you always have to take these standards with a grain of salt when you're interpreting uh, how well a certain test works. Okay. And this is sort of an example of that. This is a comparison of uh, wheel diameter with uh, specific IgE with respect to mite uh, in asthmatic children. And uh, in a dichotomous comparison, these results are 95% agreement. But when you look at look at it with respect to levels of IgE and, or wheel diameters, you see a lot of variability. In fact, you get a lot of this stuff where they have over 100 kilounits per liter and have the no skin test, or you get all sorts of uh, different diameters of wheels. Uh, and the same thing goes where you have no IgE detectable, but you have positive skin tests. Now, some people would say those are false positive skin tests. Some people would say those are false negative in vitro tests. And that's kind of where the problem lies in people making statements like that because we, actually we really don't know what's going on there. So one way to bugger up the study is uh, if you really want good comparable results, you use highly positive patients and definitely negative patients, and it usually shows really good comparisons. And in, in for poor comparisons, you can use low-level positives and questionable negative patients. And when you calculate things like uh, clinical sensitivity and specificity, obviously you get very different results depending on on whether you use uh, the first configuration or the second configuration. And this has been done in the literature, I think sometimes even on, on purpose, uh, to, to show whether a test really works well or whether it doesn't work very well. So you have to be aware of that uh, on patient selection. Uh, just a few comments on extract-based tests. Uh, that, that's, I think, been the biggest problem in this, this whole in vitro world is the extracts. And, and we, you know, different extracts have different amounts of the proteins. We don't know a whole lot about stability. Um, and, uh, and so I think that is obviously a nice lead-in to the next subject. Well, uh, right after this slide, this is a two-dimensional gel of uh, allergen extract. Of a allergen extract, and actually, you can find you can see almost 200 and some different proteins in there. This is an allergen extract. This is what is attached to the solid phase of uh, of IGS. So, um, so obviously, uh, we need to do a better job of this. So, after thinking about this, uh, it obviously makes a very strong case for looking into the. Uh, uh, component resolve diagnosis, which uh, I, I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Uh, the reason this has uh, uh, really come into being is not only the gel patterns, the ergogram patterns that I showed you earlier, but also an immense amount of information on allergens. Uh, that's available now in some databases, the SDAP base uh, database, the ALFAM database, 
uh, and the allergome and, and uh, just an incredible amount of information. And it, you can summarize this in that, that only a few families of proteins are actually allergens. Uh, allergens in the definition of whether it, uh, they can cause symptoms. Uh, uh, because if you define allergen as something that just make IgE to, then you can make IgE to a lot of different proteins. But only 2% of the, all the different types of proteins are actually allergens. So that, that, that they're quite restricted. Most of these are stable. A lot of them form polymers and aggregates, which certainly helps in bridging IgE. And they're very pervasive in nature. They're all over the place. And uh, this, this means that cross-reactivity is the rule, not the exception. Um, so that pretty much says the same thing. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out here is that uh, specific IgE production is associated with danger signals. And this is what the innate immune system actually does. It detects danger. And that's why we are starting to use the uh, anagram of DAMPS, Danger Associated Molecular Patterns, very similar to uh, pathogen-related uh, 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 PRRs uh, for toll receptors. And actually, if you really think about it, um, allergens are toxins in this sense, in that toxins are biologically derived substances which interfere with homeostasis. And that seems to be pretty much true of all the allergens that we've defined and the one, particularly the ones that are really causing problems. They seem to alert the innate immune system or that something is wrong. And that starts this whole process. Whether the symptoms are caused by that or by things further down the line uh, is somewhat questionable. Uh, but we can imagine scenarios where people with no IgE can certainly have problems from uh, exposure to these things, whereas, uh, uh, but the IgE uh, probably uh, can enhance these. Uh, the primary allergens that we're really looking at now are with respect to different sources. The fish are obviously parvalbumins. And parvalbumins are, are, are interesting proteins in that, they, well, fish allergy itself is pretty interesting. And we know there's a high amount of anaphylaxis and, and serious reactions from ingesting it when you're sensitized to these proteins. But uh, the parvalbumins, uh, they're different fish, different in their content of parvalbumins. So some people that are marginally sensitized might be able to tolerate some fish and not others. And that's kind of interesting in biology. The shellfish, uh, there are a couple other allergens that are important fish, but not as, as important as parvalbumins. The shellfish, it's the tropomyosins, the muscle proteins. There are several other minor allergens from from shellfish, but tropomyosins are the, the big player. Egg, uh, ovomucoid and ovalbumin are the big allergens. And we all know the story that people who are uh, not reactive to cooked egg, which denatures ovalbumin, uh, uh, or it, because the ovalbumin is denatured. The ovomucoid uh, sensitized patients, on the other hand, seem to have somewhat of a fixed food allergy and uh, don't seem to recover from that uh, for, the, for most of their life. Animals, it's the lipocalins, which are uh, lipid binding proteins. Uh, and it seems to be very consistent in that that's when you're allergic to an animal, uh, you're allergic to a lipocalin. There are exceptions, of course. There's the albumins. And, and they're somewhat minor allergens, but they exist. So. We've defined all these allergens now. And, and so if you go back to the banding patterns, we've actually defined the bands that are relevant, which I think are, are uh, I, I mean, that's really a major advance in understanding what's going on in, uh, in, in with respect to uh, allergy. And it should make the diagnosis uh, far more specific than extract-based tests. A good example is what we all, I think most people are familiar with, the peanut. 
and that we have uh, these different allergens. And we know that people, individuals who are sensitive to ARH2 in particular, but ARH2, uh, 1, 2, and 3, are the ones that have the more severe reactions to peanut upon ingestion. We also know that you can have Ig to propylene, which are, uh, is in almost every uh, uh, eukaryote, and, and in particular every plant, and, and uh, it may not cause uh, any symptoms at all. It takes really large amounts of exposure to propylene in a sen propylene sensitized individual to get symptoms. Uh, the same thing with RH8, which is a pathogenesis related protein of peanut, a PR10, uh, of which there are 14 that are actually relevant to allergy. But this PR10 protein seems to be particularly relevant to OAS, uh, oral allergy syndrome. Uh, the reason being is that it's easily digested and denatured. So you can get it in your mouth, but you, it doesn't, uh, it gets destroyed before it goes any further. Of course, large doses of it might be different, or if you ate it along with something that prevents digestion, this sort of thing, you could have problems still from it. But uh, it seems to be a common cause of OAS, and it is a very common protein among plants uh, uh, in that it's used in their uh, defense against uh, 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 different pathogens. Uh, kind of interesting, the RH9 seems to be, it's a nonspecific lipid transfer protein, which these are allergens, particularly among fruits and, and, and vegetables, and they, uh, they seem to be uh, population dependent. In other words, the people in southern Mediterranean seem to have fairly large problems from this, uh, these proteins, where the people in the northern climes don't. And I don't think we have a satisfactory answer for that. I'm not sure if it's genetics or if it's uh, diet or what. So uh, that's just some of the things that we've learned. Uh, and I think the future is really bright for this area. And I do give another uh, presentation later on uh, that's more involved with these allergens. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, get that in the spring. So I'm going to, uh, I see my time is kind of running low, and I wanted to get to some of these uh, ending slides. But I would encourage everyone to go to these databases and study them, uh, particularly the AllFAM database, A-L-L-F-A-M. And it's, it's really uh, a lot of information that um, that you can uh, gather, I and mean, they give the function of the uh, particular allergen. They give a lot of they don't give a lot of structural, but they give references to it, and it's just uh, it's it's real easy uh, uh, to to interpret. Um, I should mention that allergens don't come by themselves. Uh, for example, dust mite, uh, uh, dust mite allergens are mainly in their uh, deficit, uh, well, in their deficit, deficit, and uh, that certainly has a lot of endotoxin in it. And we know endotoxin is an immunomodulator through the innate immune system. Uh, glucans are uh, present in molds. They're also present in a lot of our foodstuffs, and um, and different glucans seem to have uh, different effects on our inflammatory system through the Dectin 1, 2, and 3 receptors. Chitin are, seem to be important, particularly in shellfish uh, and cockroach. These are also immunomodulators that stimulate, again, the innate immune system. Uh, phytoprostanes from grasses uh, seem to have uh, direct effects on promoting Th2 responses and etc. So we're finding that that not only do the allergens themselves have functions that interfere with homeostasis, but they also have things with them that can uh, promote Th2 type of responses. The really surprising thing is that we all don't make uh, we don't all have allergies, and uh, that's presumably because 
uh, some people have a little better uh, mechanism of suppressing these responses through uh, um, uh, Fox P3 cells or whatnot. Um, the bottom line is that that these are uh, these danger signals from innate defense mechanisms really drive the whole thing. Uh, one real big worry here is that autoimmunity uh, seems to be uh, tied into this through Th17 cells. Th17 cells and Th2 cells have some common pathways, and therefore it it, it it, it might even be that that instead of getting autoimmunity, you get allergies, and I, obviously that might be a, a better outcome for people because the symptoms are less uh, um, severe. So uh, anyway, that's uh, that's about all I have to say. I think uh, I looks like the time's up, and and I'll certainly take some questions uh, if anyone has any. Um. Thanks for the presentation, Brock. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Um, I do have a question um, regarding the, it's actually mentioned here in this slide too, the cross-reactivity and cross-sensitization with mm -hmm. specific IgE testing. So um, could you clarify that a little bit more? Is that like to say that if mm -hmm. you have, you know, like the cross-reactivity between pollens and the fruits that are similar to the pollens, is that mm -hmm. kind of what you're explaining there? Yeah. If, you, if you're... Uh, 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 Profilin is a good example. Um, Profilin from birch uh, cross-reacts with carrot, apple, uh, and several other uh, profilins, uh, depending on which antibody you make to which epitope on it. And they're not perfect cross-reactions, but they're, they, they're, they do cross-react. So obviously you could be sensitized to carrot profilin, by you know too much exposure or exposure at the wrong time or during a viral infection and whatnot, and actually uh, react to the profilin from another source. So that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, I I think that's uh, uh, that's a very common thing in in our area, and that you know that that's one of my complaints when we we have 1,200 extracts to skin test with. How many allergens do we have? It's way fewer, I guarantee you. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And also, do you, um, I guess, what I was trying to figure out is that this is sort of that general question, which one is more sensitive and specific? I mean, I, I'm kind of no. not sure, like, how you would sort of describe that in terms of skin and blood testing. It sounds like people said that, I mean, based, unless it's food, I mean, like for other allergens, I mean, sensitivity and specificity are kind of similar between the blood and skin testing, and I wanted to get your input on that. Well, I think, I think uh, for a lot of reasons, sensitivity and specificity are very, clinical sensitivity and specificity are very poor parameters. They're population studies, so the answer depends on your population, for one thing. The second part is their dichotomous, which depends on your cutoff. So if you if you use a skin cutoff of five millimeters instead of three millimeters and compare that to something, you're going to get pretty different results. So I don't think I don't I think those are very poor statistics for looking at uh, for judging uh, tests. So uh, you know, and so that's my major complaint with those. So I think. Um, with respect to skin testing, we've essentially always said, I mean, it's been stated in all our practice parameters and everything else, the skin test is the most sensitive. Well, I don't think it is, uh, and I don't think we have proof of that at all. And, and the reason is, is, well, I mean, even if it was the most sensitive, then it might be the least specific. You get my point. Yeah, it might detect everybody, regardless of whether they have it or not. So, so uh, I, you know that, that's been a, you know, it's been really driven into our brains, and that's one of these dogmas that uh, this that the skin test is so sensitive. And actually, I, I, there's plenty of evidence that says it's not. 
and there's plenty of evidence that says it's not very specific. It is a test, and it does does give you some information. I think. Uh, I think we're changing our minds on on actually what that information means. Uh, but I mean, you know, I mean, it's one of the mainstays of allergy, and and I think. Uh, as far as it's, I don't think we've ever established its actual sensitivity or its specificity. Well, I guess my question is, um, again, back to the, um, what was it? We were talking about the, um, spec like, oh, where was it? The, the clinical reactivity and cross, sorry, the cross reactivity. If you were to say, like, do a blood test for a patient who you're suspicious to like a particular food um, that the history may suggest, and then you wanted to do a blood test to support that, um, mm -hmm. is there a possibility that, you know, you're getting IgE levels that are positive for that food because of the cross-reactivity from the pollen? Or Certainly. say, like, they're sensitive to that, and then you're kind of skewed in that regard, and you're just like, well, oh, yeah, this is obviously positive, but, you oh. know... Exactly, and certainly that's that's the definite uh, picture that's emerging, and that that that's why I think component resolved diagnosis is really going to help us out there. So you would recommend like component testing at that point if there is something available. I certainly would. I I think in the future that's all we're going to have, and we okay. might have it with skin testing or uh, blood tests. Okay. And, and it's essentially it's so nice because you can. Uh, uh, you can uh, use recombinant purified proteins, which I doubt if the FDA will ever let us use those for skin testing, but if they do, uh, that, uh, that they're pure. That, you know, we know how much is in the jug, you know, and, and we know, uh, especially for immunotherapy, we know exactly how much to treat with and this sort of thing. So it, it's really going to make a world of difference. Uh, one problem there is that the powers to be in the uh, in the, uh, the top of the allergy field, don't think it's, uh, uh, they're a little afraid of it, let's put okay. it that way. You know, it's going to change things a little too much. And I think that's, uh, that's really unfortunate because allergists should be the ones to work these things out, define the relevant allergens, and um, eventually they will be, I hope. But it puts allergy in a new paradigm and that we're actually working with real technology, uh, which is something, it's kind of like the cardiologist. He doesn't care if a GP uh, gives a script for statin drugs because he's got technology that he uh, can use and, and so he's a specialist for that reason. And I think component resolved diagnosis is going to lead allergists to that same position. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you guys have any questions, you can get a hold of me anytime. I'm I'm around. I'm trying to free up time, but I'm around. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Brian. Yeah. Good. See you later. Have a great weekend. You too. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.